1912 was a notable year in America. It saw the sinking of the Titanic and the first parachute jump from a moving plane. Paramount Pictures became one of a dozen new movie studios making silent flickers in Hollywood. It would be another 15 years before they made a talkie, a movie with sound. And New Mexico and Arizona became the 47th and 48th states. Two days before Arizona was admitted into the Union, Emmett Royal Godsey came into this world. Electricity wouldn't be supplied outside the city limits for 25 years. It would be 25 years before indoor plumbing arrived in half the homes. Few roads were paved. Cars were still powered by steam. It would be 10 years before affordable radios began to enter American homes. You could have a phone, but it was powered by a hand crank. It would be three years before the first long distance phone call was made. The world went to war as Roy grew up. It became known as the Great War and more than two million Americans were deployed at the Western Front in Europe before victory was declared in 1918. Lynchburg, Virginia was per capita the third wealthiest city in the United States. A brief but national financial depression followed World War I, but that soon turned into what we now call the Roaring Twenties, which meant that Roy entered his teen years during one of the most vibrant and rebellious periods in modern American history. The economy boomed even as prohibition made drinking alcohol illegal across the country, a social experiment that backfired spectacularly. Drinking went underground as scandalous jazz age flappers flouted the laws in concealed saloons known as speakeasies. The words bootlegging and bathtub gin entered the language as the illegal manufacturing and sale of liquor increased throughout a decade. Prohibition gave crime new meaning, provoking a 12-year-long gang war that made Al Capone a household name. The decade also introduced America to a consumer economy something Roy celebrated when he plunked down $600 for a new model A Ford in 1928. By then, he had left school after the ninth grade. He had entered the adult workforce during what would have become the worst possible time to keep a job. In 1929, a financial collapse on America's East Coast and a prolonged drought in the heartland plunged the nation and then the world into what is today known as the Great Depression. Banks and businesses collapsed. Farmers were bankrupt. Unemployment in the U.S. rose to 23%. Lynchburg was spared the worst of the Depression, but the times were still hard. My, my dad's cousins lived in the, in the third house up. And, uh, and they grew up, I mean, they, these were teenagers and, you know, 17, 18, 19 years old, and, and the cousins were a little older than my dad, but right during the Depression. And so, uh, you know, and, and so the, uh, bootlegging was a big, a big deal then. And, uh, and my father was, my father always hustled for money. He didn't have education, didn't have help, he didn't have money, he just, so he just hustled, and uh, he hustled early on. He would. They'd take the take old car up and they had it modified, take the back seats out and do all this so that they could get 40 or 50 gallons of liquor in the, in the, in the car and they'd be go up in Franklin County and, and then they would bring it back and they'd take it down on 4th Street and they'd sell it to all the little nip joints down there and, and wherever they'd sell it and they'd go back and get some more. 
And uh, I mean, I heard stories about them, you know, being chased by the revenueers and all that sort of stuff. And uh, I'm, I have no doubt that it was true. I saw enough stuff that I would have thought was not true that was true. So I'm kind of assuming that the revenue was chasing them was probably the truth too. And then opportunity knocked. Prohibition was repealed in 1933 and people again drank beer. But new laws prevented breweries from owning taverns. Breweries now had to compete for placement in bars. In the mid-30s, Amheuser-Busch began marketing a new product, draft beer from gas-pressurized kegs. The metal kegs were smaller than the old casks made of oak. This made them much easier to handle and to keep cold. And they gave Roy a job. He got a job with Anheuser-Busch. And his job with Anheuser-Busch was to um, was to sell and market a new product that they had, uh, draft beer. Well, they had they had cartridges or something that would that would keep the beer fresh. And his job was to go around and to sell draft beer as a new product into bars and grills. And there were hundreds of he. He would go to these bars and grills in the daytime at lunchtime or two or three o'clock in the afternoon and develop a relationship with the bar owner. And then he would come back at night and set up a, set up a keg and pour draft beer, pour from a keg for the customers that were then to introduce this product. The Depression lasted 10 years and was followed by another world war. By the time that war arrived in 1941, Roy was married. He and his wife, Nettie, had a son, Freddie. Well, he, he is late joining World War II because of his age. For his, he, he was trained and then put on a destroyer. I do know that as well because I remember him talking about the drudgeries of being on a destroyer. So they were in a battle group. There was an, air, uh, an aircraft carrier and then there's destroyers that were following the aircraft carriers into the Pacific Theater. And um, before, they, before they got there, um, the war ended. So I'm assuming they turned around and came back. He was discharged from the Navy and sent home in 1945. He went to work as a salesman for Pittsburgh Plate Glass Company. He sold glass. He sold uh, automobile, I think he, I think primarily to automobile replacement shops. Um, but he would travel, so he would leave. He would leave early in the week and and go call around the state of Virginia. And when he came home, one time, Nettie and his young son Freddie, Fred, were gone. He he searched and searched, and then a couple of months later, and he suspected that, of course, you just don't up and leave like that. So he suspected that there was something going on romantically with someone else. And turns out, a couple months later, one of their good friends, uh, Fred's stepfather, as it turns out, Mr. Scruggs, I don't know his first name, left. He just disappeared as well. So Roy always assumed that, that Nettie and Mr. Scruggs had left with Freddie and they were now together, but he never really knew for sure. According to my cousin Joanne, he, every time he went anywhere out of town, he would pick up a phone book and, and look to see if there were any Scruggs in the phone book to see if he could find <laughs> Freddie. During his Amheuser-Busch days, Roy had seen the bar and restaurant businesses from the inside. Now it was time to put that experience to work. In 1946, famed mystery writer Raymond Chandler penned a screenplay entitled The Blue Dahlia. 
It became a hit movie, a classic film noir murder mystery starring Alan Ladd and Veronica Lake. And it also became the name of Roy's first bar and restaurant. It was, it was a cinder block building, and that, that still exists, and it still exists as a bar and grill to this day, years. It's been owned by a number of people, but nobody has ever taken the bar out. And it was the first glass bar in, in, the, uh, in the city of Lynchburg, and I think he said in the state. It was, it's a glass block bar. You can see it still there on Bedford Avenue. And now what is called the Dahlia is the original menus that, are, uh, that he opened that restaurant with are now in frames hanging above all the booths that are also original to the, to, on one side of the restaurant are original to, the, uh, to that, that facility, that building. Same kitchen, same floor plan. The Dahlia, and uh, originally known as the Blue Dahlia. That's exactly. See this? That's the hill we just came down. You see right there at the far end? That's where the Dahlia is on the right hand side there. This one. My father went to my father went to New York. They were going to Baltimore for baseball. baseball. He had a little too much to drink and he ended up there. And uh, he, they went to a bar and there was a, a, a lady playing piano and singing at this bar. And she would sing there during the uh, summers. And she'd go to Florida and entertain during the winters. Well, they had to talk to her and stop her through here and do a show at the Blue Dahlia. So he had the first. The first uh, in the line entertainment bar in Lynchburg. It was right here for the day. You said on the first what? First, first in line entertainment in a bar was right here in the day. The first pizza, pizza they call it pizza pie. The first pizza pie ever served in Lynchburg was served right here in the day. Even though it was awesome. Isn't that one? Yes, sir. And it all came from a surprise trip when he was supposed to go to Baltimore and ended up in New York. So how long were you? When, when I was a kid, I remember the Sunday paper, and, and they would have, and I don't remember what that little insert was, but they would have a, a, a little egg in there where you could send off and you could get a little, buy a little pet monkey. But that monkey came from my father and, and a couple of his cronies right here. They ordered a monkey. And they took the monkey and they went back. I think they were Schrader's field out there. And uh, they got the monkey drunk. And the monkey was just, he said, he said all of a sudden, you know, what do we do? And he couldn't control it. scratching and carrying on and doing stuff. But I got back to the Dahlia and it let the monkey drink. And the monkey ran down the street. The peak, there was a lady up the street. They called the police and said, there's a gorilla loose on and they all came out here and that's the way they told me. Is is within a short walk from Randolph Macon Women's College. And at the at the time, and, and this was this was a pretty uh, nice little the Blue Dahlia was 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 a nice restaurant that sold alcohol. They could, they, but the girls at randolph Macon Women's College were not allowed to come to the Blue Dahlia. So Roy went to, uh, somehow arranged an appointment, a meeting to meet Dr. Jack, who was the current president at randolph Macon Women's College, and pitched the idea of, of, you know, they should come and patronize this restaurant. It's a nice restaurant. It's very close to them, and that the students should be able to come. Now, they agreed to come down to the Blue Dahlia and have lunch from Randolph-Macon. So they, they came down. They came down after the lunch rush. But, and they had set up, they, they set up a, a booth for them, laid out the... the 
tableware, silverware, so forth. Had a very nice little uh, uh, deal going there. They were going to sell uh, serving uh, steaks from the grill and 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 whatnot. Very nice, uh, classy deal. Well, the blue dahlia you'll see if you film it has two doors on each side. Well, there's no air conditioning, so they those those doors stayed open during nice weather, and they were screen doors. And um, apparently, uh, right in the middle of this night's lunch, a fight broke out <laughs> in the Blue Dahlia between a patron there sitting in the afternoon having a few beers with maybe another patron. And it became a brawl, at least between these two guys, and they, they're wrestling each other. And as Roy tells it, they slammed through the screen door, broke the screen door off the hinges out into Bedford Avenue on the sidewalk in this fight. And Roy says by the time they got the whole thing uh, subsided and squared away, there was nobody from Randolph Macon left in that <laughs> left in that establishment. <laughs> they were gone. <laughs> and the rules did not change. I mean, all of it, I mean, that was the, that was the hangout going home. So it was the drinking spot for 24503. Yeah. And the parents hate the kids that are going there, young. He had a, 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 um, a thing called the uh, Sorry Man's Ball. And it was uh, once a year, they would have, everybody would vote on the sorriest man in Lynchburg. <laughs> oh my God, that's horrible. Oh, I'm telling you, what, how, I'll tell you what, how they, were, they, they were picked that by your peers. <laughs> well, I mean, it was every, every parent's nightmare <laughs> did their son <laughs> would win the sorry man's ball. <laughs> but they did. I mean, you, I mean, they did it every year. And it was, uh, that's what it was, the sorry man's ball. And, and you would, and then they would get together and they would, uh, they would say who the nominees were. And why? He had to say why this person was the sorriest person to go live. And uh, I'm just, I, the things he did down there just, he, Roy was quite a, he could have been uh, the, the, the ringmaster in the three ring circus. Lynchburg, like all of the South, was racially segregated in those years. Roy had an answer for it. The Rose Room, I guess, was an attempt to to, uh, to to gain revenue because it was segregated. So the Blue Dahlia was for white folk, and and again they had a they had a good uh, array of, of of people. Some of the more prominent people from this part of town would come by the Blue Dahlia every afternoon on their way home from work, which was on their way down from downtown. These people were congregated on this first floor in the Blue Dahlia. And just below, it, it was a segregated place for black people because Bedford Avenue, further down, further down the street, was almost entirely African-American. So black folks downstairs, Upper, upper echelon, white folks upstairs, and, and, and no trouble between the two. But it was, uh, it was 19, uh, early 1950s, so. We're in the original Rose Room, and there was an outside entrance. You came down steps and came in this door. This was a private door that went upstairs back then. You couldn't go there. Because when this was, when this was, when Daddy had this from 47 to 60 or whatever, this was, this was a black bar. So, uh, they'd come down here and the whites were upstairs. And this is the original bar that was in the Rose Room. He had all this glass put in. That was his, his little deal. So his bar upstairs had glass underneath it. Glass blocks around the around the door. Because I remember as a as a college student going to the uh, going to what was then the Rose Room was then called the cellar, 
it was an incredibly popular college hangout those times. Randolph Macon College girls could definitely come there then, as could all the other boys and, and all the townies and they and they still do. You go down now at happy hour and the place is full of bankers, lawyers, and uh, and uh, tradespeople. Um, wonderful mix of, of people. Roy and Evelyn were married in 1950 and moved to Elon Road, just outside of Lynchburg. That's where Roy owned one of his first stores. He had a little grocery store. And when Jerry was born, um, Evelyn, Roy, and Jerry lived in the upstairs of the grocery store that also sold gas. Um, but apparently, they, they didn't stay there long because it had, it had limited insulation, electricity, heat, and such and such. So they moved into 203 Hood Street. This is my first home. And as a matter of fact, it was my grandparents' home, my dad's family's home. And then I had uncles and aunts that lived, we had this whole block. Yeah. And so this, this center house, right, the second house here, that was a, a vacant lot as I was growing up. It was just, and mom and dad owned it. And, uh, and that's where I learned to play baseball. And uh, I, I, can re I still can remember the drills that my father would make me do, um, whether it was throwing it over my head and having to run back blind and catch it. This was a dairy. This was, I think it was, I think it was a quality dairy. It could have been a Westover dairy. And, it and so once I outgrew playing baseball over here, we came over here and played baseball. And my earliest recollections of uh, Roy is um, we, um, Hood Street, where we lived, was right behind the old uh, Lynchburg dairy. And they bottled milk there. And they had a big field behind the dairy, uh, an unused field. And, I, and uh, Roy used to take Jerry over and, and play baseball with him, hit pop flies to him and pitch with him and whatnot. And I remember watching, watching that. Um, my earliest memory of my mother is her ironing clothes in the uh, in the kitchen on a uh, on Sunday nights. I guess that was a routine because we had been to church that morning and. Uh, I just remember looking at her, watching her iron clothes. And the, ha the house, you know, seemed like a normal house to me, but it's absolutely tiny. We, um, every Sunday, we would go to church. Uh, my father did not go to church. I don't, I don't think he ever, um, maybe he went once or twice in my, in, in, in my recollection, but he didn't, he was not, he did not go to church. My mother was incredibly religious and, and, uh, observant and she went to West Lynchburg Baptist Church and, and which was just a few blocks from Hood Street. But then we would go uh, on Sunday afternoon to my grandmother's house, which again was uh, a few blocks more away from that. And that was my mother's parents' house uh, and have Sunday afternoon meal, which was elaborate. I mean, by anybody's standards, it was it was the damnedest thing you've ever seen. Um, I would love to be able to recreate one of those meals just once. Uh, and if they didn't give you a heart attack, believe me, no, nothing will. Uh, tiny house, tiny kitchen, massive amounts of food, and 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 my father would come to lunch for that. West Lynchburg Baptist Church. I, I mean, I grew up there. My mother had us there because that was a safe place to be. You know, you play baseball, you go to church. It's about playing playing ball from the time they got up in the morning until the sun would go down at night all summer long. Again, a lot of baseball, a lot of baseball. I, I started playing baseball, and and uh, but but. Uh, they were very, very uh, attentive baseball fans. As my father was left-handed. He did everything left-handed. He... So obviously, he taught my brother to play baseball left-handed. So he swung a bat left-handed, and he uh, threw the baseball left-handed. 
and uh, became an incredibly good baseball player. I mean, he was a, he was a star ever since he was a tiny little kid until Roy was not around a lot. But I would see him at every baseball game that my brother played, and this was starting when. Uh, I remember some games being played when Jerry was in uh, Little League. But um, Daddy was obsessed with my baseball, and uh, but his friends coached it, and and he kind of, and he but he was here all the time. Didn't make any difference what was going on, he was here. But th when I played, I played in the. Uh, I came up when I was uh, eight years old. They, I came up to the Little League, which was a little early. Normally you're 10, 11 years old. So I played here. For, I played in the Little League for five years. And, um, and I played on the same team, Southerner Drive-In. And so we, we had this field, and then there's another field right down below this one. And this is where we played all of our baseball games. And at the time, this was, this, there was a, a fence behind here, but not much of one. But none, of these, none of these fencing was here. It was a green, uh, a green board fence. And then the board fence came up the side all the way to where the dugout was. And, uh, but, and the reason I, that's, I remember that because my father would stand at the end of the dugout with one leg hanging over the fence <laughs> and he watched all of the games that way. And, uh, and some of the newer referees would come over and say something to him and everybody would just say, you better leave him alone. <laughs> he was always fired up and I mean, he, would, he, was, he was hypercritical of Jerry. He called him a big cluck. If he did anything wrong, he said, come on, you big cluck. <laughs> and I think Jerry responded to that sort of uh, encouragement <laughs> because he was an excellent baseball player. I was in a playoff game here when I was in the Little League, maybe 12 years old, and it happened to be uh, I was pitching that game. I can remember coming down to the last pitch of the game, and we were up 2-1. to one. And um, they had a guy on second. They had just gotten the first hit. And I remember throwing a curveball to this guy and him striking out and me thinking, it's over, we won it. And uh, of the two runs, I hit a home run and I hit a ground rule double that scored the second run and threw a one hitter. And my dad was with his leg sitting over the thing right there. When I came up to him, I was ready to get somebody, get, get him to say, you know, good job. He says, why in the hell did you let that boy get that hit? <laughs> and I, I mean, it, oh, it just devastated me. And I look back on it and I think, well, that's, you know, hell, that was a learning moment. He gave it to me. <laughs> and so finally, Coach Booker says, we can go until Roy gets here with the big red apple. Well, I never knew that, but Daddy, every game, before, we would, uh, before we'd leave on the trip, he told Bill Book, he says, I'm going to pay for the hamburgers and all, the, all the, the extra money you need for this trip. And he'd go around to his different vendors. He'd put this in his store, and everybody would come in, he'd make them add money to the Big Red Apple. He said, we had a game on Thursday. We're playing GW Damble, and we need to fill this Big Red Apple up so the boys can have a hamburger after they beat their asses. And that's what Bill Booker told me. Well, anyway, it was, yeah, so that was great. But that's what, uh, that's what Daddy would do. He loved, he loved, he was involved, and he loved it. He would, he would, uh, he would make commentary to, to the entire game. He was always, he was always, uh, rabble rousing, and I guess back in the day, back in the day when he grew up, that's what you did to opposing teams: uh, people to rattle and get them rattled and, and whatnot, and uh, and you had more of a chance of winning. <laughs> I don't know. We went to um, to we're playing in like a semifinals or quarterfinals to, to a state baseball tournament in uh, in high school. And we went to uh, Bristol, and we played against the team that we had to beat. That it was a double elimination tournament, and we'd already lost one. They hadn't lost any, so we had to beat them two games in a row to uh, to win the thing. And so we went up, and the <laughs> the first game, we uh, w there was a pitcher that had a high school record that was unblemished. I mean, he was whatever he was. 
32 and 0, whatever it was, the boy had not lost the game. All kinds of, you know, colleges looking at him, and, and you know, they he's gonna play pro. And well, anyway, my father, and uh, that was the game that my father put, took the big red apple out, and he got enough money to get his buddy Joe Cle Cleary, who was a, a broadcaster uh, on like one of the local radio stations. He got him to go to Bristol and actually call the game, put on the radio back here in Lynchburg. Well, so there's probably a dozen of our fans with my mom and dad all sitting up in the stands and lots of their, their people because it was a local game for them. And, uh, and so I, my father had, somebody had one of these old Ford horns. Ooga. <laughs> We get a and we get a, a hit a hit or two, and so we've scored a run now on this unblemished guy. Well, my father now is throwing the old Ford horn down somewhere in his back in this boy's backswing. <laughs> Ultimately, uh, uh, we had to stop the game several times because of the little fisticuffs going on everywhere. <laughs> and when we finished, we had beat them two games in a row. And we had to empty. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, we had to empty the bat bag. Bat, you know, you had all your bats in a big green bag, and you emptied the bat bag. And everybody had to grab a bat. We walked out, and they opened up and let us go through. We all had a bat in our hand. That's how we got her to Bristol that night. People who listened to the ball game on the radio said, "Joe said, oh, old Joe made it sound like a boxing match, <laughs> not like a, not like a baseball game." In 1960, Roy had a heart attack at the age of 48. At some point when I was about maybe three years old, three or four, he had a heart attack. And um, he survived it, but was, was being treated at the um, Virginia Baptist Hospital attack as he had a doctor uh, named Dr. Brickhouse. And Dr. Brickhouse, of course, there were no cardiologists in. He was just an internist and, and that just took care of you, took care of a heart attack patient. But my father was a smoker. And Dr. Brickhouse told uh, Roy that he said, you know, I, I can tell you right now, you need to quit smoking. He said, you are not gonna, you're not gonna live. You will have another heart attack if you don't stop smoking. And he gets out of the hospital, and I guess as as his uh, he's he continues to smoke, and he just found it too difficult to stop, I guess. And he but the, but the first time that he went back to to an office visit with Dr. Brickhouse, Dr. Brickhouse came into the uh, examination room and said, "You you do not value me as a doctor. Find another one." And my father said. What are you talking about? He said, I told you, you needed to stop smoking. And he said, and if you don't value that advice enough, I'm not gonna watch you die. Find another doctor. And he walked out of the examination room and he didn't come back. And my father said, uh, you know, of course he had a pack of cigarettes in his shirt pocket. He said he went out, he left, the, left the doctor's office, he went out, he got in his car, he said he hadn't gone a block, and he took a pack of cigarettes, threw it out of the window, and he never smoked another cigarette the rest of his life. But he had no, he had no heart disease, um, ever. He never was troubled by his heart again until he was uh, in his 90s. And then, of course, he, you know, everybody has heart disease, I, I suppose, by then. By then... Roy had sold the Dahlia and had opened Roy's Grill. Yeah, this was uh, this was Roy's Grill, and uh, and so this was the place that Dad had the longest. And uh, we've just come here now. It's only fitting that there's a uh, sign here, warning danger. <laughs> Should have had one on there 50 years ago. This was, at the time, this was the entire restaurant right here. I think maybe it would seat maybe 30 people. This road 
went in and right as far as you can see, it dropped straight down and it goes to the Lynchburg Foundry. And the Lynchburg Foundry, there were several foundries, Clay Morgan Foundry, Lynchburg Foundry, I don't know, several, uh, down on the river, on, uh, on, uh, James, on the James River. You know, one of the things that made uh, Roy's, uh, Roy's Grill, which was Daddy's place here at, the eight, at 1800 Main Street, one of the things that made it uh, special was that, that uh, it sat right here on top of this hill. You see these electrical poles going up. Just to the right of it was, um, was his store. And there was a little street that came down the hill. You can see it curved right there. You can see, it, and it goes up to, uh, uh, and, and this was the Lynchburg Foundry. And it was as, it went as far that way as you could go, all the way down this whole block. And right behind this, uh, the, you know, is the James River. I mean, you're literally right, 100 feet right there is James River. These buildings that are down now um, were open buildings, okay? So the whole side walls would come up. And they did because they were making steel. I mean, they had these smelting pots that were, I mean, just fire orange and red. When you drive through here, you'd see those people and they were, I mean, they were all around us. The people who worked, who made a living right here, were real, real men. I mean, they were tough. And, uh, but they would come to Daddy's place right on top of the hill. And he would, on, on Thursday, when they got paid, uh, on Thursday when they got paid, they, the banks were closed then. So they'd get out, they would get off at 3 o'clock and get their checks. Banks were closed to the next day. So, uh, so they would all come to Daddy's store and on Thursday night, and he would cash checks. And we'd cash, I don't know, twenty, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 worth of checks on Thursday night. So the foundry shifts would change, and they would pour in. The men would pour in to, uh, to drink beer and, and uh, celebrate being off work for the day. And I, I'm sure that happened at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, happened at 11 o'clock at night. And, and, um... Which also meant they had lots of money in their pocket you know, because it's all cash. So they're in there and they're drinking and carrying on and doing whatever. But, at, uh, but then as the month went on, he would start carrying a tab for them. So they'd get the check, pay off the tab, and have a big time. I mean, uh, uh, blacks and whites worked together. And they were real, I mean, I'm telling you, they were real men. You, you know, and, uh, but they came to daddy's place here. L a lot of whites. You know, and I, I bring it up because I mean we're not. This is not 2020. This is this is 1964. Okay, so um, and uh, and so he he brought he brought people together. And this was this was called White Rock Hill, and this was uh, this was a predominantly black community, um, and. This was the first integrated restaurant in Lynchburg. You know, uh, you know, over, uh, over the Dahlia, whites stayed upstairs and blacks went downstairs. 19, it was in the 50s, okay? But nobody had even done that. Uh, I remember Detective Brockman at, uh, went to that church. And Detective Brockman told me, he says, I'm telling you, he says, nobody but your daddy could pull that off. When he, when things got a little out of hand in here, and uh, if they got out of hand, daddy would take out his pistol and he'd shoot up through the ceiling. It got louder and louder and louder and louder. And I think somebody said something to somebody. Next thing you heard, just bam. And daddy shoots up through the ceiling. <laughs> And I mean, all of a sudden, 75 people went down to about 10. And the 10 that had been there before, crouching position, and the other, the other, other group would leave. And you hear the door slam, and they'd be gone. And a few minutes later, back on in, everybody come, maybe 35 of them come back in and fill it up again. This one particular Thursday night, Daddy just rented uh, this upstairs apartment to, uh, to a uh, black gentleman, 
And uh, that Thursday night ended up being maybe a little crazier than some of the others. But uh, so anyway, we, um, Daddy had to pull out the pistol for the second time at night. So the second time he shoots up through the thing and there's now, we're down to 10 people again. But just before they started to fill in, this little man was standing at the front door and he had a suitcase and he was standing there and he was shaking. And Daddy went to the front door and I heard him say, oh my gosh, I forgot you were up there. But he had shot up through this man's apartment twice. And the little man just said, Mr. Roy. Mr. Roy, I don't think this could work. I don't think this could work. <laughs> At Christmas time, I remember, um, and it, he was like a little country store. I mean, if it was, uh, it, 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 at Christmas time, we, I remember riding with him to Danville to some novelty uh, warehouse, and we bought dolls, and we bought watches, and we bought fake flowers, and you know, what, just stuff, you know, just stuff that would suffice as a present. But we had a lot of doll, a lot of kid stuff. And so we'd bring all of that back and he would put it on the shelves. And you could come in and you could basically do a layaway on your, on your toys. And, uh, and then they'd come in, they'd get the check and they'd get the Christmas stuff or whatever it was. And, Away they go, but Daddy knew how to do the deal. But one of the things that was most fun in at this little novelty place in Danville, they sold two types of gambling boards. One was called a tip board, and one was called a punch board. And the tip board was a board, and it had all these little numbers. It looked like each one was stapled, and you'd pull off the, you'd pay so much money and you'd pull off a tab and it would tell you what you want. So it might cost you a dollar and you may win back 50 cents, or you may win back five dollars. And so the punch board, the punch board was a whole different ballgame. So this punch board had like a thousand little holes in it, okay? And you had a, you got, you gave them a little clip and they picked the hole and they pushed it. And out the back of this board comes a piece of paper it's, and you unroll it and you read whatever it is, you know, what you win. And you could win, I mean, you could win up to a, like, a, one, the highest one was, was maybe 50 bucks or something. So that's a pretty big deal. But it was, I think it was a dollar, if I'm not mistaken, to play each deal. And I think it might have been more, might have been more than that because it paid out about, it, well, no, I guess it paid out about $2,000 for the whole board. So, but I'd sit there and I'd sit there all night and I'd have people come up and punch that thing and I'd, pay them out, or I'd do whatever, and at the end of the night, you know, we had a net of $1,000. He he would have food, they had a nice kitchen, and they would cook, and he would give away food at the end of every night. And people that needed something to eat could all come in and get something to eat. Um, if he needed some money or something, he would let you clean up or do something, earn yourself whatever you needed, whatever you wanted. and. Uh, and and he and he could stand up to the biggest baddest guys too, and it was it was just he had a it, it was crazy, but he could do it. And, and every evening, uh, he, he'd have a, he'd always have somebody he was kind of taking care of, and uh, and and one of the ways he had to take care of them is he'd bring them in and he would feed them and he would uh, and they'd come in at eight o'clock let's say and they'd start rolling well, nine o'clock and they'd start repacking the beer boxes. You know, as we all clean it up. But the first thing they do is they come in and they go back into the kitchen. They clean the kitchen up. And uh, Levi was one of his guys that he was in at that particular time was taking care of. And Levi came in about nine o'clock to do his things. And I told uh, Daddy, I said, Daddy, I think Levi is hammered. And Daddy said, Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. Well, anyway, so next thing I know. I'm uh, right out in, in the front, and I hear this bam, like hitting on a aluminum. I, and it had a big three-bay uh, sink in the back. Well, anyway, Levi had gone in and cleaned the dishes, and he put in, Levi had gone in to clean the dishes, and he put a little too much, uh, a little too much soap suds in the thing. So 
He uh, when it went back in and the soap suds were probably the, it's probably what is this seven feet off here? The, the sinks this high, the soap suds are this high, and only I can see is Levi's butt. Levi had got drunk and fallen right over in the, in the dish pan, and I went over and grabbed him and pulled him out. And if you <laughs> ever seen such a sight, I was, and my father laughed until I thought he would just die. But anyway, he got Levi cleaned up and, and gave him something to drink, sell him down a little bit, and he finished his job. <laughs> uh, uh. So, uh, there was a, a, a fellow who used to come in the place, and um, his wife's name was Miss Connie, and his name was um, Wyatt. Wyatt and Miss Connie. And, and Wyatt and Miss Connie, they were probably in the mid-70s at the time. And, and uh, uh, But Wyatt, they'd come in, and I, I remember Wyatt and Miss Connie would sit, at, sit in the booth, and, and people would pay, get, buy Wyatt a, a beer to do the camel walk which is a dance, a little, but to go back and say, tell you, Wyatt, when he was young, played the piano at the Virginia Hotel. Mm -hmm. Wyatt and Miss Connie were a colorful couple and, and real sweet people. And uh, Daddy called me one day and uh, told me, he said, after school today, I want you to come down to the store and said, bring one of your friends with you. And I said, okay. <laughs> So we pulled up to the store, and Daddy says, I, had to, I bought a new refrigerator. I'm, I'm giving this refrigerator to Wyatt and Miss Connie. Mm -hmm. Well, they lived about a block down the street. And so Gary and I picked up the refrigerator and just walked it down the street. And we went to their house and put it on the front porch, you know, and knocked on the door. And uh, Wyatt came to the door, and I, he was so excited. And uh, it was so well, wait, and got your refrigerator here. And he said, yes, sir, I'm so excited. He said, that's my first refrigerator. He was 75 years old. My first refrigerator. And I said, okay, well, let's take it to the kitchen for you. And he said, oh, just put it right there in the hall, right there, put it right there. And I said, okay. So anyway, he, um, he opened the door to the left. So this is just a box square house, you know. Normally they'd have a living room here and a dining room here. And a, bedroom or something here in the kitchen here. Well, anyway, so this would have been going into what would have been the living room. And in the living room was a bed sitting in the corner and a chair and a lantern and a wood st a stove in the, in the uh, uh, fireplace uh, and coal, black coal built up in the corner it was a coal stove, so he would shovel the coal into the to the stove for the heat. And so uh, I came back and, and I, I thought, my goodness. I mean, well, anyway, so I got back. He said, did you take the refrigerator down? He said, I said, yes, sir. He said, well, how was it? I said, damn, daddy. I said, I've never seen, I mean, that's, that's something. He said, he said it was his first refrigerator. He said, you notice anything else? And I said, well, well, I don't know. I, you know, he said, you notice anything else? Said, no. He said, you doesn't have any electricity. This was, he was so excited about having his first refrigerator. At 75, he didn't even have the electricity to run it. You know, when, when Daddy went down, he would introduce me to all the players on the street because I mean if you if you were down there you needed the players to have you back or you know it might not be a good place to be so so I got to know a lot of them but this was um uh there was a nightclub on fifth street called uh, Frank's Everyday People's Club and uh it was not uncommon for people in a neighborhood that needed some money or something to eat or had a problem whatever it might be to come to daddy for some assistance, you know, let me some money, can I get this till Monday, whatever. Well, Frank came to daddy and said, I need to, you know, I'm a little short and I need, I got a utility bill I got to pay. And said, uh, so I got, you know, a lot of stuff going on this weekend. I, you know, Monday, I'll pay you, pay you back Monday. He said, that's fine. So he gave Frank whatever, however much money it was to pay his utility bill. 
And so anyway, Monday comes and, you know, it's, and you, I guess he doesn't hear from Frank on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. Well, Thursday was my day at, at Roy's Grill. That's when the, everybody's foundry got paid and uh, and we would cash checks and I was back in the back cashing checks for everybody and doing whatever. And so, but when I first got there, Daddy said, come on a minute, we've got to go, go, we're going to take a ride. And I said, okay. So I jumped in the car. We pulled up in front of Frank's Everyday People's Club. And this is probably maybe five o'clock in the afternoon. And we pulled in front of Frank's Everyday People's Club. And, uh, and I'm thinking, are you kidding me? We get out and he's, we, he goes in, he opens the door. And I'm thinking, are you kidding me? When we went in, Daddy went in first. I'm walking behind him. And it was, hey, Mr. Roy, hey, Mr. Roy, hey, Mr. Roy. And then it was, Roy's boy, Roy. <laughs> So we walked to the back to the uh, to the counter, and he said, and Frank said, hey, Mr. Roy, how you doing, sir? How are you, Mr. Roy? I said, I'm doing fine, Frank. said, let me get a beer. Yes, sir, Mr. Roy, gave him a beer and sat up down. And so, uh, and so Daddy said, why well, you just came up, I said, you said you were paying on Monday, and I said, you just hadn't seen you. So I thought, well, I got a couple minutes, I'll run up and see you. He's probably forgot about it. And Frank said, oh, no, no, Mr. Roy, I haven't forgot about it. I said, but I, you know, I got, I, Friday night's gonna be a good night for me, so if, if, if I can maybe hold on till Saturday, you know. So Daddy finished his beer, and he said, well, I gotta go. He turned and looked at me, he said, pick up his cash register. And I said, do what? He said, get the cash register. And I looked at him, he said, pick up the cash register. I went over, and I put my hands on the side of his cash register, and I took it, I don't know, you know, six or eight steps, and Frank went, wait a minute, wait a minute, Mr. Roy, I can, wait a minute, I think I can work something out. And he came out, next thing you know, we paid Daddy for the uh, utility bill, set the thing back on out, and said, not a problem, don't worry, if you need me again, just give me a call, paid for his beer, and we walked out, and the place just, everybody just kind of parted ways, we walked around at the door. I thought, oh my word, I cannot believe we just did that. I think Roy's Grill was a very good business for my father because um, it was it was open uh, late at night and uh, fairly early in the morning. It was a 24-hour, not 24-hour operation, but it was an 18-hour-a-day operation, seven days a week. He worked all the time. He was always working. He was always down there at, at the grill. Um, he sold Roy's Grill. And Roy's Grill became um, probably a victim of its own success. Maybe a lot like the uh, maybe a lot like the Blue Dahlia. It became absolutely the busiest place on East Main Street, and of course, it sold beer, and so it drew the attention of the ABC uh, agents as well as the police. And there were always always police at Roy's Grill because there was always some sort of uh, fight ensued or, or something, and, and again, it, it became integrated. And I think a lot of these, a lot of the the, the problems were between um, blacks and whites. But I do remember that at one point, Roy brought home um, a police scanner, and he put the police scanner beside the bed. And that police scanner used to chatter all night long. So he, when he would when he would stay at home, yeah. and be able to relax and stay at home. The police, he knew that when the police called for, where police were calling for Roy's Grill or such such Main Street, he'd, he'd get up and go back to, go back to work. <laughs> see what, see what uh, had happened. He had a 38 snub nose uh, pistol and it was hammerless, so you did not cock it with a hammer. You just pulled the trigger, and the it had this little slide action that came back when you pulled the trigger. It slid back, and then and then once it fired, that slide action would go forward, I guess, and 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 create the explosion. But the reason that he uh, he had that is because one other point in his life when he really needed a gun because he was in some danger. He had a 38 snub nose with a hammer and he couldn't get it out of his back pocket. 
and he ended up ripping his whole back pocket out, trying to get this gun out to protect himself. And so he traded this gun in for this one without the hammer. Yes, he does. I said, oh, oh, that gun, he always carries that. It was like a non-weapon <laughs> to me. <laughs> he throws his pistol on the table yeah. and tells Matthew, here, take care of this. And Matthew's like, oh my God, and your uncle travels with a pistol. I said, oh yeah, forgot to tell you that part. <laughs> yeah, he kept it in his glove compartment. Yeah, we always talk about it because um, at their house, they had that bedside table uh -huh. with a scanner. Yeah. And I would sleep with them. That gun was right there. We never, ever thought about it. Touching it, but it was always he'd come home, take his gun, stick it on the yep. on the table. And everybody knew he had it. He'd go to the bank, you know, he, he you know, he'd leave here with money in the mornings and in the evenings. And so he had a pistol with him. He'd go to the bank, he'd have his pistol right in his pocket, walk right on into the bank like it's nobody's business, but they knew him. You know, they knew him, so it was not a big deal. <laughs> But he would, he would have that thing in his pocket he, when his leg was hanging over the, uh, the fence at the Little League baseball game. This gun would be sticking out of his back pocket. I remember seeing Roy's gun beside his bedside table and thinking that that was totally normal. And now I think back and I'm like, God, I, just a loaded gun on the bedside table. If people would call CPS over that these days. <laughs> but it was always right there next to his bed. But you never want to pick it up though, either. No, I, I still don't really care to play with guns. <laughs> you know, Roy's um, roll aids and gun, he always had roll aids and his gun with him. And I, it was, um, and then they were all on his bedside table at the end of the night. I, it was, uh, you know, kind of normalized having a gun. I've never known anybody that carried his gun the way Roy did. I was um, in the second grade, we moved to Campbell County to a subdivision uh, called Rainbow Forest. The uh, subdivisions are starting to be developed everywhere, and one of which was Rainbow Forest, and my mom and dad built a, um, built a, a, a ranch house, and one of the first houses in Rainbow Forest, about a block away from the clubhouse, uh, which had a swimming pool, and, and I, think, I think that he was... Uh, he was prospering. His business was prospering. I think the whole country was prospering. This used to be the American, uh, American Motors Rambler dealer. And consequently, my father would come home. It was American Motors and Ford. And consequently, my father would come home uh, at least once a year, maybe uh, every 18 months with a new Rambler. And uh, so we grew up in Ramblers. And uh, what a great old class. When Jerry turned 16, he brought home this uh, cherry red uh, car, like a, almost like an early muscle car. And I don't remember the brand, but it was new and it was, uh, and it was gorgeous. And I remember it coming into the driveway and I remember it being there for about uh, 45 minutes and I remember it being gone because my mother would have nothing to do with it. She said, he is not, he's too young for that car. It was very happy times uh, for me. I remember being very happy at Rainbow Forest. Had a huge number of friends. Uh, I guess as, as time progressed, I was maybe about uh, 13 years old. 12 or 13, I remember, I remember Roy coming home and he had uh, this, this big box of t-shirts. And these were t-shirts that on the back of them were Boone's Farm, Boone's Farm wine uh, logo. And where he got those shirts, I have no idea, but he suggested that, that I could sell them and make some money. And I'm telling you, it was like having, it was like having a, uh, a, a, a Gucci line. Everybody in my neighborhood wanted those Boone's Farm wine t-shirts. I guess because it was wine, alcohol, you know, and you weren't supposed to do that and yada yada yada. And the parents, nobody's parents objected. Nobody came to our house saying, I can't believe your son is selling these contraband wine, contraband. 
But anyway, the whole neighborhood was outfitted with uh, Boone's Farm wine, and he was right. I made a lot of money. I, I think he may have taken, he may have recovered his uh, his costs on the t-shirts and then let me have some, but anyway, it worked out pretty well. My mo my mother, all this it, 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 when when Roy had his heart attack and and uh, and up through the 60s, she was she was a uh, registered nurse and she had a job at Virginia Baptist Hospital. She had a job at Florence Crittenden Home, which was a home for unwed mothers. She had, she was a cancer nurse, uh, which she described late in life as being as being just unbelievably horrible. There was no cure for cancer, and and people were just uh, died in the most horrific ways um, with morphine used to to you know keep the pain down. Then the next job that she got that I remember most most uh, vividly is she became a, a school nurse. She went she went to work for the Lynchburg City Public Schools, as did her sister Hester. They were both school nurses. And I think that was a pretty good gig for her because she got to she got she was off in the summertime. She got uh, you know she was off uh, after school's out after time. So you know I would I would go after uh, Leesville Road Elementary, I would, I would go home to Rainbow Forest and I'd be alone a short time, but then, but, but then she'd be along uh, pretty soon. Roy knew every officer on the Lynchburg Police Force. One, Dave Weeks, was a detective who attended the same church as Evelyn. My, my, mo my mother was uh, never very happy with my father's businesses. I mean, he, she, she was, she was, uh, um, she was not pleased that he owned these, um, this type of, this type of business, a bar and a grill, and uh, and with all the all the the bad things that happen in those places. Lots of things happened down there, you know, you, you uh, uh, and, and, uh, but a lot of things would, he would always have a, maybe a new TV or a new radio or new something, I mean, <laughs> and uh, people would come in and want to sell something. My father brought home to Rainbow Forest one time a brand new Electrolux uh, vacuum cleaner in the box. And, uh, and he, so she had brought this she had gotten this new, very high-end, unaffordable to us vacuum cleaner. And my mother was so excited about her new Electrolux vacuum cleaner. Well, the first thing she did was take it back over to the Electrolux shop, and uh, and and one get them service it, and two see if there was any new gadgets or attachments you could get for it. So she took it over and left it, and, and the next day she got a call from Dave Weeks, and he said, Ellen. I need to tell you that that uh, vacuum cleaner you took over there yesterday said they ran a serial number on it. That's been reported stolen, so we'll have to take that uh, we're gonna take it back. Well anyway, my mother was horrified. <laughs> and the first thing she did was make my father go over and spend that two hundred dollars for a brand new Ledger Lux vacuum cleaner <laughs> I remember there was some there was some cold dinners, uh <laughs> the mood was cold around the vacuum cleaner story. He comes home with a fur coat. And she goes, don't you ever bring anything like that in this house again. He said, now, honey, I'm telling you now, this is legit. I bought this, it's legit. <laughs> and so she, uh, he, he leaves it there. She calls the next day, she calls Dave Weeks. And she said, Dave, Roy brought home a fur coat. And I need for you to go, and you need to find out whether this thing's been stolen or not. <laughs> and, and so he said, well, I'll check it out, Evan. So he called him back a couple of days later. He said, Evan, I've checked everywhere. And there's no, nobody's reported this coat stolen at all. It, I'm sure it's a legit deal. Just don't worry about it. Just wear it. He said, and she said, well, I don't know. He said, I'm telling you, just wear it to church, son. 
she uh, she puts that fur coat on. She wears that to church on Sunday. Went to church, went to Sunday school, went to church, at church, you know, talking all, oh, man, your coat's so pretty. Oh, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, she's leaving, goes across the street. We have a little place where we park at car on Sunday mornings. Went across the street to get in the car, and Dave Weeks comes up to us and says, Evelyn, I hate to tell you, but I might have to take that coat off. <laughs> He was, he was, in the summertime I'd see him, but, but then he would leave, you know, mid-morning. He would come home uh, in the afternoons, maybe four or five o'clock in the afternoons. He'd grab a nap and he, he'd grab uh, dinner and then he would go back and he wouldn't come home until late at night again. This is, uh, this is one of the first places that Daddy owned that I remember. I remember because I was a really little kid in here, and I remember there was a big guy inside, not daddy, that would put me on his shoulders, and he would walk me around and do whatever, but you know, I, so I was only out here during the daytime. This was a place called Bill's Barn, and it was an after hours honky tonk. <laughs> so when all the other places back then at 11 or 12 or whatever o'clock at night, you couldn't serve alcohol anymore. Well, this place would open at 12 o'clock at night and stay open to 5 or 6 in the morning. And uh, you brought your own beer and you brought your own whiskey. You paid a, and then you paid a setup fee uh, at your table for however much you brought in. And then Daddy would sell them uh, mixers. So Cokes or ginger ale or water or whatever. Well, and he also, it was a BYOB, so he just sold ice and he'd heat the ice oh, on that's the right. top. Like he would, <laughs> that was he most... put he like put it all and they'd put it on the flat top and heat it up a little bit so then they'd have to buy more ice. <laughs> People would buy buckets of ice, right? Yeah. And that's like that's what he sold because he didn't sell alcohol. He'd heat the buckets up just a little bit so they'd melt faster. <laughs> and then there was also it, after you've listened to these drunks all night long and everybody's howling, you want to go home, you're tired, and he said I couldn't get anybody to leave. And he said, so finally, I'd go back in the back in the kitchen, I'd get a bottle of ammonia, and I'd come out, and I'd just walk around, I'd throw some ammonia out on the, on the floor. And he said, next thing you know, the whole place was empty, and I could go home. <laughs> it's very ironic that it's now a church. So uh, I guess things all go around for the, for the right reasons. <laughs> now, this was a, another of Daddy's places, and this was called Uncle Sam's. And Uncle Sam's was a nightclub, which was really out of Daddy's bailiwick, uh, to be honest with you. This used to be an old car dealership. And uh, they rented it and, and, uh, and started a, a, a nightclub here. And uh, I think Daddy maybe, Daddy probably was here no more than six months. Now, this was the entrance to Uncle Sam's. And you come in here and they had a little restaurant right here. And then you go back into the nightclub, and they had some big bands. Uh, as a young kid, Phil Vassar played here at the beginning. He was from Lynchburg. He's gone on to Nashville to do all kinds of things. This was a mistake for Daddy, and he knew it. And so uh, he had a couple partners in it, and they were stayed in here, never worked, drank all the time, you know, did whatever. And so he just said, that's it, I'm done. And, uh, this this was a, this was a, a financial loss for him that he didn't have in too many places, but this one did. He came right here and he opened up Roy's uh, Roy's Corner is what this was called, and um, we were here for a number of years. And it was, it was a great story. I mean, it was a restaurant, beer, it's like all of these places. Restaurant, hot dogs, hamburgers, and cold beer, and, and whatever. And, uh, but anyway, so, and I, I got to know a lot of these folks right through here. In fact, uh, see Wilson's Barbershop right over there? Well, Lou Wilson was a couple years, he's a little bit older than me. But uh, he, and I were, he and I were good friends, and, and Lou used to, and I mean, everybody down here, I mean, you hustled to make a living, okay? You either ran numbers or you, 
sold something you weren't supposed to sell, or you did whatever, or you, you know, or you were a preacher, <laughs> and you, and you had your storefront, and you. So he would take me up and introduce me to, to the barbers, mm -hmm. and the preachers, Bishop Baby Stokes Jr., the brother Bishop Baby Stokes Jr., the Tabernacle, uh, I mean something, and um, and then uh, and and it was funny because they were all, they were all. Um, they all had a game going. I mean, they, you know, they were all either in the numbers business, so they were selling something they weren't supposed to be, or they were doing something. I mean, it, they, it was just a hustle. It was just, you know, and you understand, I mean, you, they, you know, they, they did what they could do to make, you know, money. make money, yeah. And, uh, but he said, he says, he says, none of them are, none of them will do anything to you. He says, you just, he said, you, he said, but you need, you need to meet them. And so I did, I got to meet them. There being a lot of Fifth Street in those days was kind of like the, it was a completely black uh, street and it was surrounded by black neighborhoods and there was every, every colorful character in the world you could imagine. I mean, Fifth Street was, uh, you know, ran parallel with Fourth, Fourth Street and they were always, uh, I remember stories of after hour houses where you know you'd go at midnight and and, and bootleg house and, and the the customer base that came to came to Roy's corner almost totally black and almost totally absolutely fun and and interesting people. He put an ad in the newspaper, I think. And it this it actually may have been on the menu. The name of the the name of the restaurant said where the service is slow, but you won't mind waiting because the food is terrible. <laughs> this is the one when 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 Daddy would uh, when Daddy would would his his alcoholism would peak and it would get caught and he'd go dry out and it would peak and it, you know and 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 that's how you you say he did it. His, his doctor, a great, great doctor, Edmonds, who, uh, just a wonderful man. Uh, when Roy would get to a point where he was, uh, was just really not in, not in great shape from a, from a um, drinking standpoint, Dr. Edmonds would put him in the hospital to dry out. And I remember that's exactly what they called it. I mean, he, he and he would go to uh, Virginia Baptist Hospital and uh, he would be there for several days up to a week. Um, so one of the times that they, he went over to the hospital for a little dry out session, <laughs> um, I had to come in and run this. And I was probably maybe 20 years, 21 years old. And so, but business dropped off. And so when I'd go to see him every day, he'd say, okay, how much business you do? And, and he kept, you know, the last year on this day I did this much, and this year on this day I did this much. And so that was, that was his, that was how he kept score. And he would talk to Jerry, and he'd say, how's business? How's business? And Jerry say, well, it's good, it's good. But a lot of his clientele honestly came to see Roy, and um, and it would and it fell off. Business fell off. One time he called Jerry and he said, uh, "How's business?" And Jerry said, well, "It's not doing so good. There wasn't anybody in here last night. Just a you know handful of people, and and you know we only made so much money and so forth." So Roy said, "Okay, here's what you should do: go down to uh, this used furniture store." He told him about and pick up an old beat up piano, upright piano. Have him bring it up there and put it in the, put it in the window at, up there, move the tables around, put the, and, and go, get, go get old blind Joe. And Jerry would remember this better than that. He may have been like uh, old blind Joe, he may have been uh, you know, one-eyed one -eyed Bill or somebody, but this guy was legendary for being able to plunk out tunes on a piano. And he, 
came in and he said, just tell him that Roy wants you to come down and play the piano at the corner and he can drink all the beer he wants. And we put it in on Tuesday afternoon with the idea that we're going to have music on Thursday night. So we, uh, we get set up on Tuesday night. So he comes in, he's playing around just a little bit, you know, and, and, uh, and next thing you know, there's three or four people inside, and then there's 10, 12 people inside. And, and so, uh, so anyway, he had to go, so he kind of died down. So the next night, we, uh, we went and we did it again. And uh, we had a bigger crowd. Well, we let everybody know Thursday night was the night. So next thing, I mean, we've got 75 people in this little space right here. I got 35, 40 people sitting out here. It's like saying, you no, know, I got the police, okay? And the police come in and they come in going, what are you doing? And uh, uh, I, I told him, I said, man, I, it's just kind of got in our hands. He said, well, we need to shut it down. I said, okay. So anyway, I said, everybody, that was it. So they would kind of, we'd get them on at the door and I shut the piano down. And, uh, and so I've got maybe 15 people left in the store and the street's still full of people because they all outside, they were laughing, carrying on. Well, I've got a little old man that comes in, that sneaks in, and he begs enough money until he can get a, a, get a beer, and he leaves. Well, he came in, and next thing I know, he's sitting over in the corner, and he has raised his top of this piano, and he has started to play with two fingers. New Orleans jazz, like you've just never heard it. I mean, those fingers were going up and down there. Next thing I know, the doors opened up and everybody's rolling back in. And I mean, it's like, I mean, it was just crazy. It was just crazy. And so, uh, so anyway, we had to, uh, I think maybe before I had too much of that, we had to get rid of the piano. Let's walk over and see if Lou is over here. So that was 50 years ago, Lou. Yeah. Yeah. 50 years ago. Oh, man. You know, Roy was a people person, if you want to know. That's, that's what Roy was. He was the type of person that uh, he never met a stranger, and he wasn't, he wasn't afraid of anything. And uh, he was a good friend. If you needed a friend, Roy was a good person to have as a friend. And he was my friend. I mean, Jerry and his brother, they, they're younger, but, you know, I was out here scratching, so, you know, Roy was a, a good person to point you in the right direction. You know? And that's, uh, you know, if you want to know, like I said, if anybody want to know about heroes, Roy was one of mine. He helped those he could help, fed those who didn't have anything to eat. Um, and, uh, you know, more than one time has he, you know, bail somebody out of jail or, you know, whatever. Well, he was always, I always remember he used to talking about how, it wasn't just that he had the stores, but that the stores were a center of community. And, and yeah. he supported the neighborhood, not oh, just for having to come in, but. Oh, all the time. Like the chili, I mean, he, the was, chili he, he was constantly, you know, whenever there was food over at the end of the day, I mean, he, was, he gave food away all the time. And, uh, and he gave, uh, I mean, he gave Christmas presents to kids. And he, Roy had a great relationship with the, both the ABC guys and the police and, uh, and his customers. Uh, he, he just had that, he had that way about dealing with everybody and uh, was really good with everyone. And, uh, and loved, his, loved his customer base, loved them. You know, he would get, always make time to have these conversations and develop the relationship and talk to these people and they would want to talk to him. And I watched my father treat people the way he did. I watched him, I watched him tell him exactly what he thought, right, wrong, otherwise. But, you know, I think they really appreciated it. So he did not finish high school, but I'm telling you, was, he was a smart dude. He was, he was, he was really smart about the ways of, uh, of uh, human nature. He knew people. I mean, he could, he could immediately uh, connect with people and he, he also knew when people weren't being real and he knew when people were being real and he knew when people were good and he knew when people were bad. And, and uh, 
he he just he had a he had a sense about people. He's very very skilled at people. And a lot of that I think was passed on to the grandchildren. I think he I think he imparted a lot of wisdom to them. You know, look at and it's um being being uh, they were looking at somebody on the it's, it's no different than they are. Um, and I, you know, so it's we all put our pants on the same way, and I think that. Um, I think that truly we are all, we are all are the same. We all have different backgrounds, different places, but we all are the same people, and we really shouldn't be considered any different than anybody else. Went to the hospital and uh, and checked in, and while they were, they said just go have a seat. We'll call you in a little bit. So, and back then you didn't go into the delivery room and do all of that sort of thing. So I called my mother uh, and I remember they were staying in a little motel in Myrtle Beach. And, uh, and it, it didn't even have room, it didn't have t uh, phones in the room. And so I called the main desk and, and I told him, I said, I hate to bother you, but you need to go back to mom and dad's room. I got, it's emergency and you talk to them. Mm -hmm. So next thing I know, mom's on the phone and I says, Becca's in the hospital. You need to get up here right now. <laughs> and I, I, they only been there a day. And so, uh, so anyway, you were born 648 that morning. Mm -hmm. And I was leaving the hospital. Back then, we, we walked out. There was a great room in the front of this hospital. And the little lady, and, and, and pink lady was you know, the, and they were the volunteers that would do whatever, but they were at the little front desk, and there are people sitting around because they use it as a waiting room as well. Well, I'm walking out the front door, and mom and dad are walking up the steps into the front of the hospital. And I looked at them and I says, it's a girl. My father said, son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> right in the middle of the hospital. Oh, I'm telling you what everybody looked around. Like, oh my God, did he just say that? I mean, all he could think about was, you know, throwing baseball with some little boy. Yeah. Well, I'm telling you right now, that took about two minutes to get through that. So, uh, but I, right, in the, right in the lobby, son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will tell you, he was a good granddad. I never knew that he wanted a boy. And he helped my dad open a bar when he was 18 years old. I didn't know that. Yeah, it was like, he had a bar, I can't remember where it was, but he had a bar for nine months. I graduated from Brooklyn High School in 1974, and I was going to CBCC, Central Virginia Community College. I kept telling Roy that there was a good market for a college bar. so. I remember one fall, uh, he came home, maybe I came home, he was home, and he had, he had a, a lease on the, uh, on the table for a building on Memorial Avenue. Um, and he said, here's your college bar. He said, he said, this is a, it's already set up, it's been a bar and grill, it's closed now, but it has all the kitchen equipment there. Has the booze, has the bar stools, has the bar, has the refrigeration equipment. He says it's a it's a no brainer. You want a college bar? He says he said here's your college bar. So I don't remember how my mother reacted to that news, but my guess is not very happily. But I was ecstatic. I was like the happiest human being alive. Uh, right here where this old Pizza Inn building is, there was another house. See the house, the Framery? Well, there were three or four houses right here, and, and one of those houses was a little bar restaurant. And so we decided we would get uh, New York Times papers, Sunday papers, for a couple of weeks. And we glued and hence decoupaged the walls, all the walls with the New York Times uh, newspapers. And then my father had it painted the most horrific green that you have ever seen in your life. Walls, trim, doors, bars, bar stools, back room.
And there were two things that Roy said that we had to have, and that was um, pinball machines, foosball table, and a jukebox. And I and and I said no, 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 no. He said no, non-negotiable. He said he said he said I don't care how busy or I'm not busy you are. He said they'll pay for the place. So and he says and that money's mine. So put in a put in a jukebox and had great music at the time. This is 1976, probably. So great music on the jukebox. We had we had a great great bar, great business, and it was filled um, every night with Randolph Macon Women's College students and um, Lynchburg College students, and it was it was. Incredible business. We sold beer out of uh, refrigerated mason jars, 50 cents a beer, a can of beer. Well, Roy, Roy oversaw the place during the daytime. And uh, Royce told me, he said, uh, and I was not happy about this, but his, his business at that point, the people that loved Roy more than anybody in the world idolized him and loved to hear his stories and his antics of past were these bikers, these 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 leather-clad, badass dudes on Harley Davidsons, and they would come in every day to see Roy and have lunch. If they were on construction sites, they'd ride over in their construction clothes, and these these were legendary old biker guys in Lynchburg, Jimmy Cunningham, and and half these guys had incredibly profitable. Uh, subcontracting businesses and they came in and the place every day by three o'clock was packed with bikers the weather was nice they were diagonally parked harley davidson's a block and a half you know wheel to wheel up the up and down the street and uh just humiliated me but roy said and of course he was right he said these guys will all leave when your college kids get here tonight. He said, I promise you. He said, he said you know, I, I've told them. They have to. They can't be in here. It's my son's bar at night. You guys got to go. There would be motorcycles. You had to line them up, stack them up like that side by side. They'd be lined up all the way down, all the way down as far as you could go. I mean, it was cash just on, packed on top of cash, on top of cash, where these selling these 50-cent beers. And, then, and he was right, the jukebox and the foosball table, we had a glass top foosball table and a uh, cork top foosball table. And we had some of the most skilled foosball players in the whole region that would show up over at the tavern because we had, that was the name of it, the tavern, because we had no, uh, nobody, nobody else had these tables. And the quarters that had to be emptied out of those things were just amazing. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't go through a night without having to empty the quarters out of all of those machines. May comes along, and, and, and the other thing Roy had warned me is he says, you know, who, who's your customer base when these college students go home? And I said, I don't know. I said, you know, I'm sure we can, you know, we'll do fine. And he said, no. He said, these guys will take care of it. He said, my, my guys will take care of it. In the spring, I was still going to CBCC. It was my last year at CBCC. And something that I had never experienced in my life before is I was flush. I had money on, stacked on top of money. I was, I was like a gangster. And so Roy, I told Roy I wanted to go to spring break to Florida. So my friend Tommy Marsh and I, my, Roy loaned us his old Dodge. It wasn't old at the time, but it was a Dodge uh, sedan. And we took off for uh, Florida and had a hooping good time and very, very upset with what I found when I got back from my spring break trip. And that was the biker guys were the employees. Not only were the biker guys the complete and lone source of uh, business in there, but they were also running the bar. 
And so I came back and I was all of a sudden bar- bartended by this guy was about six, seven, named Robin Stump, <laughs> who, was, who was the quintessential Hell's Angel looking guy. And uh, sweet guy, I liked him. And, and, and what happened was the, uh, the place got incredibly loud and, in, and incredibly busy. And the and, and we had a eleven o'clock uh, restriction on our beer license, and so and and Roy also had told me that at, at the outset. He said, I said, because I said, you know, eleven o'clock's not late enough. It's it's you know that's not going to do, and he said, you will never have any problems with this place if you close at eleven o'clock. He says, the Dahlia will have the problems, the Village West will have the problems. The uh, windmill on, on Hollins Mill Road will have the problems. They stay open until 2. And he said they will have spent all their money here, and they will go and fight at those other places. And he says, and I have already told these guys that there is never going to be a fight in here, and there's never going to be anybody that's, gonna, that's going to, uh, you just take care of Eddie. He never, he never told me that. But I got the sense that I was a, kinda, I was a protected uh, employee of the tavern, so which is really good. Never had a fight in a tavern, not one. But when those motorcycles would start up at eleven o'clock at night, about twenty neighbors would call the police because they would roar out of that neighborhood, <laughs> and it would. So eventually, we were given notice that our ABC license was going to be taken away. And how we uh, maintained the ABC license uh, for as long as we did, there's only one explanation for that, and that and I had had been downstairs. Every every one of Roy's uh, places always had a bedroom attached, some place that, that you know he could get away for a while and go to. This this one was downstairs, and I remember walking down the steps of the uh, of the tavern down to this low uh, basement bedroom, and you can just imagine the. Uh, the, these places underground, one little basement window, dark bed, sofa, a couple chairs, whatnot. But more than once, I go down and there's Roy and the ABC uh, agent and a bottle of vodka and some other people down there laughing and hooping it up. And, and you know, there's, there's the ABC guy down there until I guess so much heat was put on him that he had to revoke the license. And I know Roy's back in the hospital on the closing night because Jerry and I ran the business on the on the closing night, and we knew it was going to be we knew it was going to be something, and we prepared for it. We bought as much beer as we could possibly buy. We bought um, we took all the trash cans from the kitchen and put them out, filled them up with beer and ice, and so that we could pull beer out of those big cans when the coolers ran out. And we had a we had a freaking party that night. Just the police went nuts. The place went nuts. When the police finally got there, Eddie and I were sitting inside like, I mean, it was just out of control. We couldn't do anything with it. They'd taken the booze out of the walls. The front door, the glass front door was complete. All the glass was gone. I remember when the when the police, the detective walks in, he steps through the front door like this, <laughs> and he walks back to us. He goes. What the hell have y'all done? The police came. Roy's in the hospital. He's got a television in his hospital room. And on the 11 o'clock news, he sees that the tavern is being, is the site of a, of a, a big story on WSET news anchors, whatnot, over there with cop cars, ambulances, paddy wagon, they, they did kind of a sting across from the front of the uh, tavern was a street that came down. They came, they blocked off two entrances of uh, Memorial Avenue. And then they brought the paddy wagon down this third street right in front of us and turned a corner and they arrested 18 people. They just, they just picked at random 18 people because it was, it was wild. It was absolutely mayhem. And then the next day, there was an article in the newspaper about it. And uh, 
He very proudly had that uh, newspaper article in his wallet for the rest of his life. Finale of uh, of uh, the tavern, and that was also the last bar and grill that my father had because I don't think he was able to get another ABC license. His his name was on the ABC license that I ruined for him. As a young boy growing up, I was always uh, told that, uh, you know, I mean, I, I had a brother, Eddie, and, and uh, but I also had a, a half-brother that I just knew about. I didn't really, he wasn't in my life, I didn't, you know, and his name was Freddie. And Freddie was, uh, was, uh, uh, was daddy's son by his first marriage. Eddie did all you could do back then to find, find him, and, uh, and really never did. So I remember, and, and, and but we were told about it. So he wasn't we were hiding anything. So, but it was, and it wasn't, you know, so, but, it, but he wasn't, he wasn't, we didn't know where he was. And I remember I came into my house one night in, uh, it, probably, it was probably 84, 1984, in mom and dad's house in, uh, in uh, Rainbow Forest. And my mother was, white as a ghost and I went into the kitchen and my father was on the phone which he rarely rarely was ever on the phone and he was on the phone and the only thing anything whiter than my mother was my father <laughs> so we finished we hung up and uh, and so here's the story um, Freddie had been married had just recently gotten married maybe a year before uh, his father had died the year before, and his wife's, his new wife uh, would ask questions, and I was asking about t uh, uh, Freddie's father, and she said, "You got to call him," and he said, "No, no, 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 can't, you know, just," and she insisted. And so Freddie and his wife went to his mother, who had never mentioned his father, my father, to him at all ever. And it was never brought up, never in conversation at all. And basically said, uh, I want to know who my father is. I want to find him. She gave him a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, leads to the Lynchburg area. And, uh, and so uh, his wife, Judy, uh, called several numbers. And she finally reached this lady. And she said, uh, says, is this where, is Emmett Godsey there? And uh, mom said, uh, does he live there? And she said, yeah. And she says, um, can I speak to him? So daddy got on the phone and the girl says, uh, do you have any sons? And daddy said, yeah. He said, I've got two sons. And he said, Jerry and Eddie. And she said, do you have another son? And he said, uh, yeah. And says, his name's Fred. And she said, would you like to speak to him? <clears throat> and, and that was a, I mean, it just, I mean, my father just completely melted. They make arrangements to come to Lynchburg to meet mom and dad. And they're flying into Washington, D.C. They are, we know absolutely nothing about them. And so they are given directions to the Texas Tavern. Come right across the bridge and stop the Texas Tavern and we will meet you at the Texas Tavern. So they met at the Texas Tavern right there and they drove out to, uh, now this is now 10, 11 o'clock at night, you know, may, at least that late. And so they get out to, uh, they get out into mom and dad's house, and the, and, it, and so anyway, it, it was just, it, it went off the rails. My, my sister-in-law, Judy, is so petrified of flying. I mean, pet, can you, I mean, and Freddie is petrified to meet daddy. And they are, and they come from a little bit of a drinking background. So they pretty much got hammered to get on the plane. And then they brought like these 16 ounce, couldn't do it now, drinks and mixed them all the way to, all the way to Washington. 
And then they had to, you know, well anyway, by the time they got to mom and dad's dining room table, I don't ever remember, ever, 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 a bottle of whiskey sitting on my mom's dining room table or an ashtray sitting on my mom and daddy's table, my mom's table, or the curse words that I heard that night from my mom and dad's table. It was the dan I got a call at one o'clock in the morning yelling at me, come out here and meet your brother now. But they were, uh, they were something else. They worked in casinos. He was a uh, pit boss, so he was in charge of uh, a number of tables. And she was a blackjack dealer. And the only, only shift they would let husband and wife work together was the third shift. And so they went to work at 11 o'clock, uh, you know, 10 o'clock or whatever time it was, and they'd get off at 8 o'clock. Uh, Ann and I took, uh, took her mom and dad and my mom and dad out to Reno for a trip that was... Um, First got married, we took her mother and father and my mother and father to Reno, Nevada to meet, to Friends. visit with Freddie and Judy. Yeah. All of them in the car, so there's mom and dad, and Bob and June, and then there's Freddie and and, uh, and Judy. Judy in the back, and Ann in the front. And Freddie just absolutely could stir something up in just a second. I mean, he could get daddy going like nothing you've ever seen, and he was, and they, absolutely went back and forth and every and, and I remember I finally I'm still sitting in front of the casino and I, I left and they were starting to you know I argue not argue but just you know just carry just, on <clears throat> I drove around the block and I pulled back in front of the casino and I got out and I put it in the park I said I'm not going and I left them all sitting right there in the car my father had absolutely driven me completely crazy <laughs> My brother passed away a year ago, two, a year ago. Uh, something was so silly, he choked on some food at a, a dinner that he was involved at. I really am happy that Daddy was able to, to meet Freddie. And um, I'm glad Freddie got to meet uh, his dad. He then uh, opened up a grocery store not, not too far away from uh, not too far away from Roy's Corner, and again in a in a uh, um, neighborhood that was that was uh, full of black people, and they again he named it Roy's Store because there's always Roy's. And the place, from the time he opened, it was always busy, but he was always in there. And, and he didn't know anything about running a convenience store. But he told me, and I did help down there some, was he says, if anyone comes in and asks for something, and uh, we don't have it, put it on this list. So after about two weeks, the place was fully stocked with everything anybody could want and what they did want. And I mean, it was pretty remarkable. It was a very uh, old-fashioned way, analog way to, uh, to figure out what your inventory should be. Finally, after a, after a long time, he was able to get his uh, to-go beer and wine license. And that was a big deal because that, you know, he could, he, that, sold, that stuff sold really well. But he also sold some prepared foods. And for some reason, he painted, a, he painted outside on the outside of the building he painted the name of the bus business Roy's store but he painted a skull and crossbones and uh, big almost as big as the, as the um, as the name of the store logo and below it he he, he, he had painted this man did not eat here <laughs> There was a dry cleaners uh, attached to it that, that was on here, and then Roy's store was from right here over to right here. So he was half open.
chunk of it. It was half of it. It was two, two, this was a, this was a, um, I don't remember the name. Maybe Lou would tell you the name, but it, I don't recall, but there was a, a, a black gentleman and I got to know his grandson real well because he was more my age. And his grandfather who ran this, oh, he was, he was probably 80 years old, but really kind gentleman, really, really nice guy. And then daddy had his sore right beside him. And this was a parking lot right here. Because this was the first inner city project, if you will, that yeah. was built, it was built right there. Typical neighborhood of, of daddy's customers. And this is it, I mean, mm -hmm. this is it. And uh, you know, it's not really, not many, not many, not many white men could could be able to come in and, and be able to come into a community like this and one, be accepted and to be uh, um, uh, respected. Respected. Yeah. You know, and uh, and 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 still and be relate with to them. people yeah. and yeah. yeah. I can remember. I can remember uh, coming when, when Daddy wasn't available. I, they had my number um, uh, for for emergency. Mm -hmm. And so they would call, and this is after your mom and I were married, and so. And they would call me, and I'd go at 2 o'clock in the morning because somebody had broken a window mm -hmm. or done something, you know. Well, I'd come down at 2 o'clock in the morning. Now, during the day, this is what you'd see. I'd Nothing. Come. 2 o'clock in the morning, that parking lot was full. Wow. People all over the place. Kids. I mean, it was really, was, it was wild. That was, it was, so it was almost always a Saturday night or something, Friday night. The, the, the memories I have of the stores that he owned during you know that timeline um or going with him to his uh store in downtown i think it may have been fifth street the store is no longer there any, anymore but um but we would go there with him sometimes and it was a neighborhood store in a um probably you know, an underserved or impoverished area and with mostly uh, your black clientele coming in and I can remember, um, you know, being in the back room where he had his safe and there he would count his money. And, um, and I can remember being up front uh, behind the counter with him and him seeing him interact with his clients who came in. And I think he had, from what I could tell at that young age, a very you know good relationship with, I think he was as much a part of that community as all the people that came into his, his stores. 800, six to 800 square foot store, mm -hmm. you know. When you walked into the store, there was an office all the way at the back, aisles of food here. There was like a cash register right. here. They had a deli counter on the left. Um, and then, of course, I, I told the little story about uh, the little boy coming the in. The ice cream. With the ice cream. I remember that. <laughs> well, anyway, this is where he uh, he was standing. Granddaddy Roy used to make a living, okay, and he took care of us by running a little store. So one day he was coming in, and I was I was behind the counter, and he was trying to. He said, "I want you to see." The little boy walked in. He was about your age. He walked in a little store. Now I'm telling you, this whole store wasn't much bigger than this living room right here. And he walks in the store, and he's walking around, and Daddy said, "Jerry, watch him." And I watched him, and a few minutes later, I saw him go over to the ice cream machine. We had a, like a big old case that had, you know, you slide the top off and you get ice cream yeah. sandwiches or things, you know. So anyway, he took an ice cream sandwich and he put it in his pocket. Daddy, Daddy sat there and he said, just watch him. I said, we could do. He said, just sit there and watch him. A few minutes later, he walks to the front door and the little boy walks out the front door. Just like you would if you walked into a store and you didn't want to buy, you, you looked around but you didn't buy anything and you just walked out. Well, he walked out with his ice cream sandwich in his pocket. It's about 90 degrees outside, just like it is right now. And the little boy walks outside and daddy walks out behind him and goes, come here a minute. <laughs> he goes, yes, sir. And they all, all call daddy, Mr. Roy. And he goes, yes, sir, Mr. Roy. He said, what you been doing? He says, how's your mama doing? How's your brother doing? And the little boy stood there and stood there and stood there and he answered his questions. And about 10 minutes goes by. Now, what do you think's happened? The, the ice cream is all down the side of his pants. Oh, Big old stink. Because they, they knew it and then you wanted to melt. 
And he just let it, he sat there and he talked to this little boy until that whole thing melted all the way down the side of his pants. And the little boy's just squirming and squirming. And so finally he said, now, I want you to go home and I want you to tell your grandmother what you did. And I want you to tell her to promise you that you'll never do it again. And I guess that was in 1978. He, he got to a point where he was, he was really having problems. And uh, he would have issued blackout drunks and things like that. And I remember I was at, I was at VCU, but uh, I came home and Jerry had, had come. And while he was, he was uh, passed out, put him in a car and got him, got him checked into a, uh, uh, a treatment center just outside of Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, and I cannot rem remember the name of it. But anyway, he spent, he spent 30 days there. And, and, you know, of course, and I guess he knew it, but I mean, he could have left any time he wanted to, but he didn't. He chose not to. But I think he was, he was at this point, he realized that he was not going to be allowed to see uh, Jerry and Becca's children. And at this point, Barrett was definitely on the scene, and maybe Blair. Uh, not yet Tyler. But n knowing that, that that was going to be taken away from him, he stayed at the uh, Fellowship Hall in Greensboro for 30 days, uh, went through the whole AA business. Um, he came home, and uh, he didn't drink anymore. It's kind of like when he, when he threw away his pack of cigarettes. I mean, and, and you, know, he, he, you know, he did not need to go to a meeting and pour his heart out, nor was he going to. Um, to stop drinking. If he needed to stop drinking, he just stopped drinking. So he did. Well, it's hard. Habit changing is hard for anyone. And it's almost impossible for a lot of people. But the fact that you can quit at 72 and not drink again until 96, I don't think he was, he was uh, addicted to alcohol. Because he, he, he did drink a couple of times in the meantime, and, but he was able to right himself right away. He becomes all of a sudden this this uh, phenomenally involved grandfather.
And we had a t-ball game at Lincoln, or Lincoln Middle School. And I had just gone and bought my first Chuck Taylor Converse. And they were bright yellow, much like these guys. Bright yellow, and Roy came out to watch the game, and he, first thing he said to me was, where'd you get them yellow shoes, boy? And all game, I could just hear him yelling, laughing about my yellow Converse's that stood out like a sore thumb, I'm sure. I mean, they were neon, fresh out of the box. Probably not so after the game. Well, I remember I hit the ball, and uh, it was probably only supposed to be a double, but I guess I heard Roy screaming as I'm rounding second, and he was on the third baseline behind the bleachers. And when you're a kid and you're running with a baseball helmet, that damn helmet's shaking all over the place. It's really not something that you know what's going on. You're just kind of running blindly. And I was six years old just running. I could hear Roy laughing, run with them yellow shoes, boy! <laughs> and so I ran to second, and I didn't stop. I ran to third, I didn't stop. The catcher may have had the ball for what would have mounted maybe five seconds, maybe the whole time when I was running down the third baseline and we were six years old. And all I, all I remember at that point was just boring straight into the uh, catcher. I was six years old, and it was like a World Series collision. <laughs> and helmets fly off, dust is everywhere. And uh, I'm laying in the ground, kind of concussed a little bit, and everyone's like, oh my God, what happened? After the game, he, still, he was still laughing about the yellow shoes. His last few years, he, he was he, he continued to be healthy, and he was he was uh, he continued to help people. And I'll tell you another interesting thing about Roy. After he did retire, uh, I think the last the last little store he owned was on uh, Gray Street. It was also called Roy's Store, and it it was he didn't have energy or the. Uh, or the pizzazz to, to, to it just didn't, it didn't, it, it lasted maybe a year. But then he, then he, he decided he was going to retire. And he did that kicking and screaming because he, he liked to be in that business. He liked to make money, liked to be around people. Um, he went to work as a volunteer for the Daily Bread. I am at the Lynchburg Daily Bread. It was established in 1982. The Daily Bread serves lunch every day of the year to people who can't afford to buy one. How many meals are you now serving? Two or three. The most we've served, the biggest day we've had, and this is just here, not outreach, was Tuesday of this week, and it was 507. Lori Babcock asked him if he would uh, uh, be willing to go and pick up food find, and find oh, donations. So he went to everybody and said, hey, what I'm doing, I'm picking food with the Daily Bread. I'm coming by here, I think it's three times a week or something. And he says, we need to fill his truck up. And so, all right, bro, we'll fill it up. And he goes to the different, and he pulls up his back, and he's going very loud and kind of, you know, full of himself kind of guy and making laugh and everybody. he come in and they fill the trucks up. And I remember him saying he'd never seen as much food, but he just kept bringing stuff in. But then, at about 11 o'clock, I think the door was open to 12 maybe. 11.30 or 12, I don't whatever time they opened. At that time, everybody stood around outside until they, you know, it was time to come in. And, this and I remember going down there and cooking with him, and he would be back behind there. Do you know, he was kind of like the maitre d'. Walked around to all the tables and talked to everybody, and, you know, he was kind of like a little host play that he did there. Well, and let me just tell you, your age, that was a maitre d'. Yeah. To tell you what he was. <clears throat> Daddy used to own a store right around two blocks yeah. around the corner from there. And, uh, and plus, up on Fifth Street. And down, I mean, so he knew everybody. Yeah, very much he so. He knew everybody it anyway. And so, um, what they started off getting him to do was to come in at 11.30 and be basically the bouncer. Ah. And so Daddy knew everybody. And so he was kind of the intermediary. Mm -hmm. And he'd say, now, come on now, you <clears throat> come on, set, settle down here. Or he said, now you're not coming in. I will get you a plate and we'll do whatever, but you're not, you, you, you gotta go back and 
and if tomorrow if you come back like this again, you know, I'll get in tomorrow. Well, we'll get you a plate. But he would he was kind of the the doorman. Mm -hmm. and, uh, which he makes offered, sense uh, when you know, I was there. Which, which offered some security and safety to everybody there. However, it was now a comfortable environment because nobody had any fear. Mm -hmm. So it was a much, <clears throat> much more uh, happy environment. That's how know? I remember it. And so... Uh, Daily Bread and all these people are lined up and we go in the back door and he's like, now you don't let the people in until I say so. I said, all right. So he says, okay, you can let them in. So I'm letting them in. And one of the guys came in with a Tommy Hilfinger shirt on. And Roy said, what are you doing here if you're wearing Tommy Hilfinger? <laughs> oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> you're gonna get in a fight right here in Daily Bread. <laughs> He's like, no, I'm not own Daily Bread. I can tell them what to do. You know, I wouldn't, wasn't doing much. I was mostly, I walked around a bit with Roy once everybody was at their tables and said hello to everybody. and. You know, they'd ask who I was, and I told them who I was. They're like, oh, you're Roy's granddaughter. And I mean, you felt famous being and Roy's He became granddaughter. famous. I mean, literally famous again in the, in the Daily Bread. And he would use his own truck, and he would drive around and pick up food from, from anybody who would give food, donate food, you know, in his, in his truck, and he would come back, and he would work from early in the morning until after lunch, and then he would go home. But every day, in any day that that was open, he was there and he was uh, helping at the Daily Bread. He had, a, he had a Toyota diesel engine truck, and he drove that thing incessantly picking up food for the Daily Bread. I remember going to the Daily Bread in it and having the back of the truck, we went to multiple places on our way to the Daily Bread and collected food. And then there's this exit in downtown Lynchburg. I think about it all the time. Oh, an express. <clears throat> yeah, and the first exit, you're not allowed to go up and take a left. You have to take the second exit, go down and around to get down that road. And so I remember driving with him and he goes up that road and I said, Roy, you're not supposed to take a left here. He said, I'll be damned, I've been doing this for 80 years. I'm not gonna stop now. <laughs> So we're driving through the community, and he doesn't stop at any of the stop signs. I'm like, Uncle Roy, oh my God, you've got to stop. You don't have to stop in the neighborhood. That's ridiculous. I'm like, okay. So then we come out to the main road in front of Lowe's, and I'm pumping the brakes. I'm in the passenger side. I'm like, oh, God, he's going to go through the light. And he's like, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm hoping you'll stop. He said, what do you think? You're an idiot. Of course I would stop. I said, well, you didn't stop for the other five stop signs. He said, well, they were in a neighborhood. They don't count. <laughs> and you think back now, like even when we would go on trips with them, like we were never in a seatbelt. Uh -huh. But Blair and I used to ride in the back boys truck from their house on Don Ridge Drive to Kroger's. Like literally sitting on the wheel, wheel, wheel size, wells. Wheel yeah. wells of the truck. And he'd go over brick. He made it, he made it purposeful. <laughs> to go over big bumps, so you could feel the bump. That's and then right. He, then he'd look out the back and crack up and... <laughs> I think anybody today would ever let kids, little kids, young kids, ride the back oh, of the truck no, the way they were He purposely <laughs> hit bottles so that you would bounce in the back of the truck. And unfortunately, he had a little uh, little window that was open. <laughs> yes, I remember. You know, between, to between the cab and the back of the yep. truck so you could... You, you can talk to him and say, slow down, or Speed up, I almost or... fell out of the truck, I'm hanging off the side of the truck, and, and he could stop and so he could crawl back into the truck. <laughs> he pulls into the food line, was at the bottom of like 5th Street, and it's kind of a downhill drive. He's flying in there, and I'm like, oh, boy, oh, boy, are you going to put on the brakes? He said, yeah, he pulls the handbrake. And we stop in front of the store. I'm like, oh my god, that's how he drives. <laughs> um, did he lose his driver's license? He'd go in, and you'd have to retake your he license. He would drive the truck, right? He'd drive that white truck. And he um, would get the lady to come over, and he'd like sweet talk her into answering the questions for him. <laughs> so he had his license way longer than he should have. <laughs> so I guess he finally 
stop driving. <laughs> he finally like he crashed into somebody's house. And that's no, I think he, yeah, I think he drove into a ditch. He was he was driving that white truck and he drove into like a ditch just off like, the side okay, of the yeah, street or can't. something like that. I guess the last the last years of Roy's life, he uh, his his heart got weaker and weaker. And I have a friend of mine who's a cardiologist, his name is Tom Nygaard. And Tom ended up, uh, ended up being Roy's cardiologist. And uh, Tom probably kept Roy alive for an extra five years for sure. But I remember one time Roy was in, uh, Tom told Roy he needed to put in a pacemaker. And Roy was, I'm gonna say he was, well, first of all, um, when Roy was 88, he had a quadruple bypass, so he had heart blockages. And that, of course, was done by a cardiothoracic surgeon, I think it was uh, uh, Dr. Bell who did that. And they, they didn't do that operation on 88-year-olds, but they decided that on Roy he was healthy enough that he could not only survive the uh, survive the operation, but would thrive after. And they were right. Tom Nygaard, when Roy was about 92, uh, or 93, suggested he needed a pacemaker. So I remember being in his, in his pre-op room when uh, he was about to go in for the operation and Tom comes in talks to us talks to Roy never known anybody had a much better bedside manner than Tom Nygaard and my mother and father both loved him dearly uh, as you do with doctors that keep you alive I, I found that's a common trait but anyway they love Tom so Tom says look you guys just chill he said this won't take but about 20 minutes he says it's really quick and and he says we don't have any problems he said he'll be back in 20 minutes so just hang around so anyway there's a television on if television was on at the time tom was in tom took they rolled him out they went they rolled him back in and tom comes back in and he says how you feeling mr godsey he says i'm feeling great he said you wouldn't believe it he said but he said that damn television is driving me crazy he says i don't know why they put that in while i was having my surgery. And Tom said, well, Mr. Gossie, that, uh, that television was here and it was on when you went out to get the surgery. And Roy said, well, I'll be damned, I don't remember it. He said, I, I have a hard time believing that because I don't remember it. And Tom said, well, Mr. Gossie, he said, when we rolled you out to put your pacemaker in, your uh, heart rate was 18 beats per minute. He says, I'm surprised you remember anything. <laughs> And he says, and now your heart rate is 66 or something, and that's what it's going to be the rest of your life. <laughs> and Roy was so proud of what Ree and I accomplished uh, with this business and with Taylor and Leela. And um, when, we, when we started our business, I mean, we, we started, you know, it was, uh, it, it was a successful business right away. And, and of course, and it, which provided Ree and I with, with uh, a nice income. And, um, and I think, again, a, 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 a lifestyle that he just couldn't wrap his head around. Um, but, he, but he was very, very proud of it. And uh, he loved coming to Meriwether's. And we would, we would, we would take him to Meriwether's a lot. And by this, by this point, Roy had probably the most aggravating thing that, that uh, happened to Roy was he lost his teeth. And he, he hated his false teeth. And he hated wearing his false teeth. And, and after a point, he didn't care what anybody thought. He wasn't going to wear those false teeth. So they never fit correctly. Uh, they said there was... Uh, bone erosion to the point that they couldn't do any kind of implant or anything. Uh, there was nothing to do. And, but they couldn't fit him properly with false teeth. 
So he came to the restaurant and he would always eat this uh, roasted red pepper and crab soup and he loved it. When he got old, he says, I hate seafood. He said, I don't see how anybody can eat fish. I don't see how anybody could eat lobster, crab, what have you, you know? And we said, well, well you, you should try this crab cake or something, you know, it's delicious. Oh my God, I can't believe anybody would eat crab. So the trick we realized after a while was to serve it to him and not tell him what, what it was. And he would eat the, he would eat it like it was uh, fried chicken. It was soft. He could eat it without his teeth in, and he was happy. And he used to love this roasted red pepper and crab soup, but he never knew it had crab in it. So the uh, his last couple of years, we'd always celebrate his birthday uh, at Merriweather's, and we all would be there: Jerry, uh, Ann. Um, Skyler, I mean, I mean, everybody, all the grandchildren, they were able to be there, and all of my children, and Jerry and, and, and Rhea and Eddie, and had huge, big tables set up for us at, at Meriwether's. And we always did it on Wednesday, because on Wednesdays, we always had live jazz at, at Meriwether's. And Roy loved to hear the jazz, particularly if they got into some older stuff. And he also uh, loved the fact that at some point, during those Wednesday nights, one of the uh, one of the regular uh, customers, always somebody different, but but would come over and ask him to dance. So he would go over, he would go over to dance. And he would get up and he would pick the blondest, prettiest woman at the bar and go up and ask them to dance. He no would, matter what, he could literally sweet I'd, talk and I'd say he'd disappear. He'd disappear and then you'd look over and you'd see him, see him out there dancing. <laughs> a little. Uncle Roy and I would dance at his birthday dances when I'd come up. Oh, let me tell you what, nine years old. Yeah. We went to uh, Meriwether's mm -hmm. for a dinner. He always liked to go to Meriwether's because all the people made over him. This beautiful woman named Linda Dorson came over and asked him to dance. And I mean, she was striking. She was about, she was taller than he was, had long, beautiful blonde hair, beautiful, absolutely beautiful woman in, inside and out. She came over and Roy's dancing with her. And she said, he's dancing along and he's having this big time. And, and he looks up at her at one point and he says, Linda, he said, if I was 10 years younger, he said, you and I'd be riding the same pony. <laughs> In 1984, um, I moved, I, I became the district manager for the Equitable here in Lynchburg. And we used to be in the old F&M building right down below us on Main Street. And we moved over to this building, uh, the Allied Arts Building. And uh, at that time, some new owners had, uh, had purchased it. Um, uh, and, and so anyway, they finished up the whole sixth floor for us. And uh, and best part of the deal was they gave me a key to the top floor. The river, and I remember coming up in the mornings and the steam was coming up off the water. And you could follow the steam line all the way up and all the way back through that mountain. And you could see it for as far as you could see. It was absolutely in incredible to see. Well, I was telling my dad about it. And so and he said, I, I want to come see it. So he and I uh, came up here and uh, we walked, we spent a long time here, but we walked around this building and it circles all the way around. So you can see 100% of all of Lynchburg. But daddy came up and he started talking about different places that, uh, that he had been associated with uh, from the top of this thing. And it was, uh, it was pretty amazing to hear him go through it because uh, he had, a, he had a, a, a restaurant down at the lower end down there that's Commerce Street. He had one on the corner of Commerce Street and Ninth Street. Um, he had uh, one up here on Church Street. Um, trying to think, but he, and, and then of course, the Roy's Grill, which was down the lower end of Main Street. And this was a good place. He and I had a, had a nice time. I, we didn't talk, we didn't, we didn't do a whole lot of that. You know what I'm saying? And. Uh, 
But that particular hour we spent up here was, uh, was pretty meaningful. And, and I will tell you that uh, I know that uh, I'm proud, and, and, but I know how proud my dad would be to think that his grandson owned this building that we're standing on. And that building right there, which is the Virginia Hotel, which was a big deal when, uh, when daddy was uh, growing up through here. Uh, much in the way that he did, I mean, he, he was a placemaker and he did, he created places where people could come together and be together and uh, shared a you know, shared experience. And um, what he did in his career at that time, it was much as much like what I'm doing now in this time. And they're, they're just, they're different. I'm, I'm creating places and, um, and environments where people can share experiences, whether they're living or in the same building or the same roof, interacting that way, or they're having dinner at, together as a family in a restaurant or having a drink with a stranger at a bar. Um, things that I've done in downtown Lynchburg are in many ways very similar to what he did, just at a different time. And maybe you'd call it on a different scale, but if times were different and he were, his circumstances were different, he may have been doing the same thing. And I think, um, and, and, uh, and maybe, it may be, you know, that's uh, my, my love for, for creating and placemaking maybe comes from some of the, what I saw in, in, in him and the placemaking that he, that he did for his career, his job. As crazy as all of these stories are about Roy, he was always, for as a grandfather, um, just a quiet, loving guy. He always had his chair, he always sat down, had his chair, but it was never, he wasn't the crazy man. No, no, no. Which I think is amazing that he had a different, maybe it's just because he was older. I was born after a lot of the, after he closed many of his, I guess probably most, famous establishments, the ones you hear all the stories of him about. Um, and, uh, but I spent, I spent many, many nights, many weekends with Granny and Roy throughout my childhood. I can remember going out to the screen porch when I'd get up in the morning, he seemed to always be up and he was out there having his cup of coffee and listening to uh, uh, Roy Orbison or radio, or sometimes he had a Police trans uh, police thing that would let you hear the different police radios and things going on in the area. Sometimes he would be listening to that. I think the first time I was introduced to Johnny Cash was with Roy on on that porch, and uh, and I would just go out there and sit with him for as, as long as you know, I don't know, thirty minutes, an hour, two hours, and you know, play puzzles together or listen yeah. to. He, you know, he always sat on his porch in his favorite rocker, and we listened to Western music, and <laughs> Granny would do crosswords, and we'd play solitaire, and you know. I remember a day where he got all his teeth pulled, and I was standing <laughs> down. <laughs> always his teeth. I didn't know this was happening, but Granny down there in the basement, uh, sewing or something, and uh, I'm up there, I don't know, making a ball like Count Chocula cereal or something. They always got the best, whatever the current theme cereal was, like Mr. T's cereal or like Star Wars, every time I go over there, it would always be the current, like, you know, what's the hottest, like, branded. And that's what y'all asked for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They got it for you. Yeah, that's all right. But I was up there making something in the middle of the afternoon. You never really saw Roy in the middle of the afternoon. He comes kicking in that door in the kitchen, and it kind of bangs up against the other door, and he's got his little, like, uh, pocket square neckerchief in mouth, and <laughs> and it was like, it looked like he had gotten his teeth knocked out and they didn't do anything. Well, he just left that damn dentist in such a hurry. He came over to that Granny, and Granny come walking up there. It's like, well, that's what happened. And like, he's like, what the hell doesn't help me? <laughs> and I was like, what happened, Granny? What did he think? Roy just got his teeth pulled today. And I was like, all of them? He's like, yep, all of them. I was like, 
Y'all didn't tell me about this? He comes home, like, teeth. Traumatizing. Yeah, my God. <laughs> Loving ways he uses kind of he, uh, play with uh, he would play kid with kid with Granny <laughs> off edge. I just feel like he often and I think Granny, you, I think she actually liked it, even though it looked like it was annoying her at the time. But it was it had an kind of an endearing way of <laughs> communicating with each other and playing with each other. And he would do that, I think, as much to get a rise out of her and to entertain us <laughs> as anything. I, um, he'd do something to frustrate Granny, and Granny had a, a fly swatter that was on the wall, and she would grab it, and she would chase him around the house, and he would be laughing. And he was quite clearly doing it to, to get just to get a, a rise out of us. I remember counting money with Granny and Roy. It seemed like Granny always counted the money, which was probably <laughs> smart. That's right. <laughs> But at the end of the day, when Roy would come in from work and he would have these, these little, you know, banker bags and they I remember getting in Roy's truck all the time with Blair and I, the old white Toyota. And it had like the blue pleather, she pleather bench thief. And uh, <clears throat> he'd always pull out his little thick shooter and his money bag, this little sky blue money bag. And he throw it in his uh, little glove box right there. And then when we were cleaning out the house, I found the two money bags in the basement. And they're just, I mean, they're empty, but... So now, I use those two blue money bags at the sanctuary. One of them's a deposit bag for every, every show. And the other one, I collect stickers and stuff and all of our old gear. When I found it in Granny's house, the first thing I did was I opened it up and I smelled it. And it smelled just like his truck. Mm -hmm. you know? So people don't really know where the money bag come from. They're like, why do you have these old money bags? That's because it belonged to my grandfather. I found one of his rings that he was given um, to by a customer. It was made out of a pipe and it like looked like three rings and had his initials on it and I wore it probably until I worked for 15 years. It's my, it's my favorite. <laughs> Loved him so much. An endearing, loving, yeah, caring um, person. I was he, was, he was like my, my hero, for my sure. He looked at everybody like right before he died and told everybody that I was gonna be okay when I was not doing good. And that was kind of cool. And I think he definitely, he definitely could tell, he could see. So that was, that was special, you know. At the end of the uh, the dinner, Roy and I were sitting down at the corner, to, you know, seats at the end of the table, and uh, everybody's over there dancing, hopping around, and Roy and Roy is talking about hobnobbing, and uh, and he got his old cup of coffee, and uh, he was he was laughing at me because I was drinking champagne or wine or something like that, and uh, he was like, "What are you doing, Roy? You can drink that with your pinky up," and I was like, "What?" <laughs> And uh, so he was, he and I joked for probably about five minutes about how high your pinky had to be to elevate your status. And so he's sitting there, and I'm, I'll never forget, he and I were pinkying up back and forth with his coffee cup and my wine. He's like, get that pinky up, boy. Get that pinky up. And so now I make toast with everybody, and I always remind him, drink with your pinky up. Just because he had such a special place in my heart, I did spend every weekend with him. Mm -hmm. um, it's been wonderful to see everybody's face. And I really do appreciate, on um, behalf of the family, uh, everybody being here. It really, uh, really means a lot. It, mean a lot. It, mean, it would mean a lot to Dad, and I know it does. Um, thank you, Reverend Newman, Reverend Kent, for, and everybody here at West Lynchburg for their uh, support and help. Uh, I wanted to take a few minutes to, um, everybody here knew Dad one way or the other. 
And uh, when I say that, he had a, a lot of different sides. So some of you knew some sides and some knew the others, and, but very few, few of you knew all of it. So I thought I'd take a minute just to kind of share a few things. Dad uh, was 96 when he passed away. Uh, he grew up, uh, in a, born in 1912, grew up during the Depression, didn't have much, didn't have much of a formal education. But he was blessed with uh, an incredible heart. Uh, he had a true sense of loyalty to others. He had a lot of street smarts and a silver tongue. He was in the Navy during World War II, came home, and unfortunately his first marriage didn't survive uh, the time away. But I think most devastating for him was the fact that he lost contact with Fred, his son, for about, 25, for about 40 years. Dad later worked as a traveling salesman and made a lot of friends. Just about everywhere you go, somebody had a story. Or, but you can, uh, I could, I've heard a lot of them. <laughs> and um, I've seen a lot of them, participated in some. But uh, I, I can imagine him going into a group of strangers and within just a very short period of time uh, being the king daddy. So... Uh, <clears throat> After that, uh, he was fortunate enough about 60 years ago to meet my mom. From what I hear, uh, she wasn't buying some of his lines, and uh, he had a little work to do. But uh, being the incredible salesman that he was, he, uh, he made the sale. <clears throat> and I know I thank God he did. This wasn't supposed to be like this. <laughs> he spent the next 50 years taking care of his family and his customers in more than probably a dozen different businesses. He operated successfully because he earned the respect of everyone he came in contact with, because he was consistent, he was fair, and he was honest in all his dealings. He always considered himself lucky and shared uh, what he had with others around him who had a lot less. A lot of dad's customers fell into that category. He made a living in predominantly black neighborhoods, which looking back on it was really quite an achievement given the times that he, he worked. I was fortunate to have spent a lot of time growing up in those stores. I can't tell you how often I was asked to take food or firewood or coal to somebody who didn't have, uh, didn't have anything. I delivered Christmas gifts more times than you can imagine to underprivileged kids long before it was fashionable or politically correct to, to do it. He lent money to people, he paid power bills, he paid water bills, and he never expected to be repaid. He was a good man. <clears throat> he was... Um, he was proud of his brother, Ralph. He was very disappointed that Ralph died early. And I know he missed him. He was crazy about mom. Never feeling quite comfortable about how lucky he was to have her in his life. <clears throat> I know he was proud of Eddie and me. And he loved us a bunch. I think he was most proud of uh, our abilities to find Ree and Ann. And he, uh, he loved the way they took care of us. He was, uh, he was thrilled beyond belief when Fred came back into his life 25 years ago. And if Judy was here, I know he'd want to say thank you for making that happen. That was, uh, that was something that happened that I don't think he ever thought was going to happen. But nothing really came, uh, came close to how he would swell when he, with pride when he talked about his grandchildren. He couldn't believe how beautiful and how smart they were. And he couldn't believe he had any part of it, but he had a big part of it. Whenever we'd share a story about one of the grandchildren, we'd be talking about, you know, one, this one did that, or Tyler did this, or Blair did that, or 
Taylor came along and did this and so on. He was the first one. He was the first one to say, don't worry about them. Those kids are going to be fine. <clears throat> you know, I always felt uh, some guilt when I moved away from Lynchburg. And so as a result, I started calling my mom fairly often. And, uh, and we went through a period of time when, when I wouldn't make those calls, I'd, uh, I'd hear something from mom or from dad. So through a little bit of guilt, I maybe made those phone calls a little more frequent. Uh, but over the years, they've become a part of my day that I wouldn't change for the world. <clears throat> um, most of you know, dad never, never liked to talk much on the phone. When uh, you'd call and he'd answer the phone, because he was always the first one to answer the phone, he would, uh, he would say, how you doing? Let me give you the mother. And so I talked to mom. He was more of a, a face-to-face kind of guy. But when you were with him, he really didn't, uh, you didn't do much talking, you did mostly listening. Because uh, he kind of kept things going most of the time. During one of my more recent calls to mom, uh, she asked me to take on the job of picking up dad's ashes from Dukie's funeral home. So anyway, I made several trips to Lynchburg before I really came up with the, the nerve to go on over there and, and do that. Fortunately, it was uh, the guy Dugitz was an old family friend of ours, and uh, I'd known him growing up. And uh, so we sat down and talked for a minute, and he brought, uh, he brought the little box in with the little velvet pouch, and I thanked him, and I walked out the door, and I'm going, you know, <laughs> what do I do? And so I, I, I put him in the car, and uh, put him in my car, and, um, and that's where he stayed. And I was, at, uh, I was at a ball game last weekend with Skylar. We were tailgating, and we opened up the back of the trunk, and I said, uh, I said, here's, uh, here's a cooler with some soft drinks, here's a bucket of chicken, and here's your granddad. <laughs> and she, uh, after she got the little look of shock off of her face, I, I explained to her that, you know, I've talked to my mom every day for such a long time. I really, you know, you didn't get many chances to have really one-on-one good conversations with dad. I was fortunate enough probably to be in a position to have most of them, a lot of them. But anyway, I told her how nice it's been over the last couple of months to be able to drive down the road and pick up the phone, call mom, hang the phone up and talk to dad. And uh, one of the few times I've had him in a car talking with him that, I, that he's really listened. <laughs> it's been pretty nice. <laughs> Anyway, he would, uh, he'd be very proud right now. He loves you. He would say, hit me on the head with a hammer. He'd be like, oh, hit me on the head with a hammer. Roll on, roll on. And then it's all over till next year. He'd say that every Christmas. Well, it's all over till next year. That and what was his goodbye? What was his goodbye? What was his goodbye? I don't know. Piss on the fire, call in the hounds, time to go. That was Roy.